All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our friend and colleague, actually my new friend we just met yesterday, uh, Amit Pinto from Georgia Tech. Amit is the Carlton S. Wilder Associate Professor there at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, he has his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Mumbai in India, did a master's at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, interestingly enough, and then uh, studies at Georgia, uh, excuse me, at um, Virginia Tech. He was uh, for faculty at Northeastern for several years, uh, working for our good friend and colleague department head there, Jerry Hajar, who was on the faculty here for many years. And uh, let's see, awards. He uh, won the NSF Career Award in 2018. I was on that panel. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, and then uh, he also uh, received a 2019 Paul L. Bush Award uh, for Innovation and Applied Water Quality Research. Uh, so with that, I'll give it to Amit. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me, Ray. Um, um, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I had heard stories about the underground civil engineering building for many, many years, and it was awesome to finally see it. Um, so uh, I am... I'm at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. I just moved there a few months ago. Um, and my research group, and I'll talk about it a little bit. So today I'm going to talk about monitoring microbes and managing their ecology and drinking water systems. Um, we focus on sort of theory-inspired computational and experimental approaches uh, for water engineering applications. And in my research group, we tend to think about ecological theory, physiological theory, do experiments in field, uh, uh, on the field side of things, we can do experiments in the lab and then use a range of different computational approaches to try to assess whether, you know, we went into those experiments with certain theoretical assumptions or hypotheses, how did that pan out? And a computational work can go from bioinformatics to some stochastic modeling to multivariate statistics. A lot of my work these days, um, or primarily has been on microbial communities in the engineered a water cycle. And I say urban over there, but I should really replace that word with engineered water cycle. And this is microbes at the interface of environment, infrastructure, and public health. And what drives our research is sort of this vision to sort of develop microbial management frameworks to maximize the benefit and minimize the detriment of, of microorganisms on infrastructure, environment, and public health. So depending on where you are in the water cycle, the impacts can be quite different. The types of bugs you want on the wastewater side are not the ones you want on the drinking water side. So that's, that's kind of the scope of the work we do. A lot of the work is focused on the drinking water side of things, a little bit on the wastewater. Recently, we've gotten a little bit into the harmful algal bloom side of things. But today, I'm going to talk largely about drinking water um, and about the microorganisms that occur in drinking water systems. The types of lessons they've taught, taught us as we've moved through the process and how it's kind of created research op opportunities in unexpected directions in other parts of the water sector, in other parts of the water cycle. So just to give a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about drinking water, you know, this is data from 2016 from a survey that Water Research Foundation did. In, in terms of how much water do we use on a daily basis? So the average American family uses about 138 gallons of water per day for a range of uses from toilets to showers to dishwasher. And that water gets to our home um, from a very complex ecosystem. Oftentimes, you know, I don't have to um, you know, say this to an environmental engineering crowd, but anywhere outside environmental engineering, you know, they don't see the infrastructure that brings that water to us. That infrastructure spans nat the natural environment, the drinking water treatment plant, and the distribution system. So the drinking water ecosystem extends beyond the tap and take, makes its way all the way into the environment. As environmental engineers, as water engineers, what we're trying to do as this water migrates and the microbial communities in these water migrates across this source to tap continuum, is we are trying to reduce the amount of substrate available for growth and maximize the amount of chemical stress to minimize microbial growth. So this is an example. This is totally arbitrary units over here. On the y-axis, you have concentration. On the x-axis, you have the drinking water continuum that goes from the source 
to the treatment, to the distribution system, and premises plumbing or building plumbing. And here you have the concentrations of the substrate. So what happens is water comes in, and through a bunch of physical chemical processes, the substrate available for growth, whether it's carbon, whether it's nitrogen, starts decreasing in concentration. Then you go through biofiltration, presumably, and then the concentration remains quite low until maybe you have an ingress or some other situation happening in the distribution system and it goes up. But what we've fundamentally done is use this multi-barrier treatment to reduce the amount of substrate available for growth, right? That's one approach that we use to kind of constrain microbial activity. The other approach that's used in um, most of the world, not everywhere, is the use of disinfectants. So we also add a lot of chemical stress to inactivate these microorganisms. And as the water moves through the system, that chemical concentration, the disinfectant concentration kind of goes down. And if you open your tap early in the morning after overnight stagnation, you probably won't find a lot of disinfectant in there. So we're using these two levers for the most part, right? And these are fairly in, sort of indiscriminate in terms of how we apply them to control microbial communities. One, reduce their concentration through disinfection and then steal, steal all the food or deprive them of the food that they're going to need to grow. Now, this is how we've done drinking water treatment for a really long period of time. And, you know, I'm painting with a broad brush. Here. There is a lot of diversity in drinking water treatment systems from system to system. But despite this, what we find is when we go into drinking water systems and we start looking at the microbial community as a whole, we find that the community is actually quite diverse. So this is a meta-analysis done by one of my students, Melina Bautista. She now works at Carola Engineers. You know, what she did, this was back in 2016, where we said, you know, let's try to figure out whether there is, what the diversity of uh, drinking water microbiome looks like. So she went in and she collected all the 16S rRNA gene sequencing data that's out there from drinking water systems. And 16S ribosomal RNA gene is a conserved gene that you find in a more, you know, all bacteria and archaea, and you can sequence it to get some information about what type of microbe is there. And she kind of put this tree together. And what we find is, yeah, there is a lot of, in any type of meta-analysis, there is a lot of confounding stuff that's going on in terms of methods that are used, the protocols that are used. But nonetheless, we find some conserved traits in types of the types of microbes that we see. So this is just a simple, that a cladogram and each tip represents an operational taxonomic unit. And you have information about its taxonomy over here and abundance over here. But the take home message, it's quite diverse. Now this is just restricted to bacteria. If you go in and now you're not looking at a single gene, but the entire extracted DNA, right? And you randomly sequence that DNA, what you find is not just bacteria, right? We are seeing archaea in these drinking water systems. We are seeing eukaryotes in this drinking water system. Bacteria are still the dominant a domain on the Y axis is the relative abundance and the X axis. I'll come back to what these axes means in a little bit when I present more data, but it's a complex ecosystem. It's a complex microbial community and it's a diverse microbial community, right? Physiologically diverse, phylogenetically diverse, physiologically diverse because they are actually experiencing all those different conditions that we sort of engineer for them, right? There are pH changes, there are um, substrate availability changes. There's, you know, there is um, sort of across the whole oxidation reduction potential changes that they're experiencing, but they still survive, they still make it. And it's, you know, relatively abundant. I'm not gonna say it's amazingly abundant, but in drinking water systems, we'll find typically somewhere between a thousand to 10,000 or 100,000 microbial cells in every milliliter. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot when we put it against other ecosystems like wastewater, for example. It's a good thing that our drinking water systems have far fewer microbes than wastewater systems. But this is, this is not nothing. If I kind of take these numbers and I multiply it by the amount of water we use, we're getting on the order of 30 to 40 billion microbes showing up at our homes on a daily basis to the drinking water system. Now, that's a large number, not large compared to some of the other exposures, but still quite consequential. If I now try to assess where have we focused as a community uh, when it comes to drinking water microbial communities, and I, I'm kind of looking at a time frame when molecular methods, culture independent methods started being applied, right? In the environmental engineering community, this was in the early 90s or so when really PCR, clone libraries and all that stuff 
started showing up. And I do a literature review and I say, I'm going to use the term drinking water with pathogen, coliform, crypto, pseudomonas, legionella, mycobacteria, microbiome, microbial ecology. And what you see over here is that in terms of publications, we've heavily focused on stuff that makes us sick, right? For good reason, but we haven't really focused on the microbiome or the microbial community. Now, there are lots of research groups that are doing amazing work, but this trend is rather new in terms of looking at the ecology of drinking water microbial communities. And we focus on pathogens because pathogens are very, very important, right? There is a significant increase in the legionellosis diagnosis in the country over the last decade. So this is data from the CDC from a report that came out or a paper that came out last year. So you almost have a tenfold increase in legionella infections, the same with NPM infections across the country. So pathogens are important. Pathogens really kind of have a significant impact and you can quantify it. And you can quantify it in terms of how many illnesses. You can quantify it in terms of economic costs. So this analysis from the CDC also kind of concluded that just five waterborne pathogens contribute to about 7.15 million waterborne illnesses in the United States, in excess of 6,000 deaths, and 3.33 billion in terms of direct healthcare costs. This does not account for lost productivity people who don't show up at work, who can't show up at work with, because they are ill or, you know, or, you know, all these different, different ways in which we figured out how we lose our productivity during when someone's ill during this pandemic, especially that doesn't show up. So, you know, it's significantly higher. So good reason why we are focusing on pathogens. What I want to do today is I want to try to make the case that pathogen centric and not microbiome inclusive is a lost opportunity. Right? If you were to focus on the microbiome as a whole, can we think about, can we innovate new ways to approach the whole drinking water sort of treatment paradigm? And you know, just because the system is so poorly studied from the microbial community perspective, does it kind of throw up unique problems and insights that once we start digging into them, start translating into impact into other parts of the water sector? And so what I'm going to do is rather than talk about drinking water microbiome for most of the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about this. Like, what have we learned from studying the drinking water microbiome, you know, over the last, you know, in my research group over the last 10 or so years, that is having impact in places that we did not expect, right? Um, and that to me is, has been one of the most surprising parts of sort of this journey over the last um, uh, last several years of a research group that's focused on drinking water microbiome. And then we run into something and we say, hey, that is impactful way over there. And let's see what we can do about it. So that's where I'm going to spend a good amount of time today. Um, so if you came expecting a fully drinking water microbiome talk, um, I'm sorry, April Fools. Um, uh, but I think, I think, I, I hope you'll like it. I'll also talk about some drinking water stuff as well. So, so studying the drinking water microbiome has led to problems and insights that have impacted other parts of the water sector. And I'm going to focus on two problems. When we asked ourselves, who are these drinking water micro microbes? What are we seeing in our data and why doesn't it make sense? And where are these drinking water microbes? Why aren't we seeing them? And it doesn't make sense. And I'm going to try to build on that. And hopefully it makes for a good story. Right? I haven't presented it this way before. So um, some more of guinea pigs here. But nonetheless, who are these drinking water microbiome? Microbes, you know, why are we seeing them? So we published a paper about 10 years ago now where, um, you know, what we, what we said was, this was an ESNT, that microbes that grow on the filter, that colonize the filter, do a really good job of seeding the downstream processes. So this was a drinking water treatment plant in Ann Arbor, Michigan during my postdoc years. Um, it was taking a combination of surface water and groundwater, putting it through a range of physical chemical processes, ozonation, biofiltration, chloramination, and then out in the distribution system. And what we did through some sort of diversity balance is figure out that in this particular system, if you were growing on the filter, these dual media filters, you actually were detected in the distribution system quite a bit. So if you took all these microbes and lumped them into these two categories, bacteria from the filter, not on the filter, 
yeah, if you're on the filter, you may have to what we saw in the distribution system. So this was a very interesting insight for us. And there were lots of implications for this. What we also saw in this study, so this is from 2012, also saw in this study is that once those bacteria were able to colonize the drinking water filters, you know, there was, a, there was some amount of predictability over here, right? So here is an NMDS plot where I'm gonna show each color corresponds to a different sampling location in a distribution system, or rather each dot corresponds to different sampling location or distribution system, and different colors would correspond to different months. And over here on these two plots, which you have is I'm showing four different taxa, right? And how they change over time. And so we go from month one to two, three, four, five, So what this data kind of tells us is that in a drinking water system, there is this reproducible annual cycle that you were seeing, right? So a microbial community one year apart can look very similar. And so there is some sort of interesting adaptation going on, right? They're adapting to the drinking water ecosystem over here and they keep showing up. There is a source water effect over here as well. You see cycling in source waters, but the drinking water is selecting from it. Now, this is paper in 2014. And then I got really interested and say, you know, what I want to do is I want to figure out what's going on. Why are some microbes, because source water has lots of different microorganisms, and only a subset are getting selected and moving through the system. Why are some microbes better than others at colonizing and showing up reproducibly in this drinking water system? And maybe the answer is in the metabolism of these microbes. And so I got super interested metagenomics, let's just sequence everything, let's assemble genomes. And I kind of got into this, you know, a couple of years, I was playing around with these tools, assembled a whole bunch of different genomes, and you can see them. Um, this is a reference phylogenetic tree, and you can see these microbes, genomes that are assembled. And this is where I ran into my first kind of, who are these microbes, right? A lot of the names that you see from metagenomes kind of map onto the 16S stuff. But once you start putting the genome together, and you know, 16S sequencing and genomics is like 16S sequencing, you get to find out their name. And metagenomics, you see where they were educated, right? Who their parents were, where they lived. So you get a lot more context to that information. And so I, I was working on it. And then I, this is called emergent self-organizing map. And this is where we are taking short reads of metagenomic data. We are assembling them into long reads. And then we're trying to cluster them using KMER frequency distribution, like tetramer signatures that you see on each individual content. And the stuff that kind of is within each of these brown ridges represents kind of one genome or population genome. And this is where we stumbled into this little bin that you're seeing here. All those yellow dots are the contexts associated with that particular genome. And we said, that's cool, right? It was a high quality genome. And we did its phylogeny. We extracted genes associated with the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. We said, ah, this is a nitride oxidizer. This is a nitride oxidizing bacteria, nitrospira NOB. And then we, I, you know, I saw some other stuff in there that I just kind of put it aside and said, this is contamination. I, gotta, I have to go take a course in metagenomics to be sure what I'm doing is, is correct. But turns out that it was correct, that this was a nitrate oxidizing bacteria that had genes of complete of ammonia oxidation. So not only could this bacteria oxidize nitrite to nitrate, it could also oxidize ammonia to nitrate. Uh, to nitrite. Now this is, a big, this is kind of a big deal because since the late 1800s, we assumed that the function of ammonia oxidation and nitrate oxidation were fundamentally divided between two different bacterial species. Right? What we realized then is that we had stumbled into a bacterial physiology or a bacterial population that had been hypothesized about 10 years ago called Comamox bacteria, complete ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And this, what it did was add to the story of the nitrogen cycle. And why is this finding this so important? You know, in wastewater treatment systems, for cost savings, right? Anamox processes, partial nitrification processes, all of those processes are premised on the dogma that nitrification, complete nitrification is divided between ammonia oxidizers and nitride oxidizers. 
So you can strip that nitride and take it to dinitrogen gas. But as soon as you put the Comanox bacteria there, right, it has the ability to kind of jump over that assumption. So that's why it's quite important. Like we had seen unusually high abundance of nitrospira in wastewater. We were not the only research group who had seen that. Lots of research groups saw it in wastewater systems, but in the wastewater systems, the way this was justified for a long time is nitrospira have a diverse metabolism. It took seeing it in a drinking water context to think, to figure out that this was not contamination, that there, this was a physiology that actually belonged. As it turns out, when we submitted that paper, what we didn't know that there were two other papers also in review. So we were about two weeks late to the party. Um, but nonetheless, it was, you know, for me, the, that month and a half was one of the best months in science, right? I was, you know, I had, I had done my PhD in nitrification in wastewater systems, but then I was seeing this organism on the drinking water side of things that kind of sort of almost made redundant a lot of stuff that I had learned on the wastewater side of things earlier. So this is interesting. And this kind of took us on a journey to look at the wastewater side of things. So this is one example of where we asked, who are these microbes that don't make sense? And now we have found something that could potentially have applications on the wastewater side. So for the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about Comomox bacteria on the wastewater side of things, right? So the first thing we did when we kind of, not the first thing, but it took a couple of years to get there, is how widely are these complete ammonia oxidizers are distributed. And so we worked with a few different companies, water utilities, at several water treatment plants across the country, uh, nutrient removal plants across the country, to just ask the basic question, okay, we found it in the drinking water side of things. Are they really important on the wastewater? Because that's where you would imagine having significant impact. And this paper is published over here, so I won't go into a lot of detail about this for now. But what we did find is these are actually quite widely distributed. In fact, if you take all of these systems and you arrange them by their solids retention times, this system is a biofilm system over here, you see a pretty good signal of how common Comamox bacteria are. On the y-axis is Comamox bacteria as a proportion of all ammonia oxidizers, Comamox plus AOB. And you see, as once you get above an SRT of about 10 to 15 days, Comamox bacteria really start becoming an important part of the ammonia oxidizing community. In an attached growth system, they are sometimes 80% of the ammonia oxidizers. They are doing most of the ammonia oxidation. We've gone back to the system now and using differential sort of kinetic inhibitors, we've done some assays suggest that Comamox oxidizes about 80 to 90% of the ammonia in this particular system. So that's massive, right? What this paper led to is some other interesting questions. So we had this data is from qPCR, but we've also done a lot of shotgun metagenomics on these systems. We had extracted the DNA, sequenced it, assembled the genomes. And the crazy thing that kept coming up is the fact that this is um, a phylogenomic tree of nitrospira. So you see some NOB here, NOB here, and you see some Comamox here. Clade A is Comamox, clade B is Comamox, and these are NOB. And you see the red Comamox bacteria over there? They're all clustered in this very, very tiny little cluster called the Candida Candidatus nitrospira nitrosa cluster. And from that particular study, we had only four genomes across 13 systems, but these genomes look remarkably similar to each other. So we started asking ourselves, you know, we've discovered this new, you know, there is this discovery of a new uh, ammonia oxidizer. Of course, there is gonna be a push to try to design, understand what is the context for design and operation of systems around this ammonia oxidizer. You know, there were groups already uh, kind of um, advertising this as the green nitrifier because it can't produce nitrous oxide. It doesn't have the genes. Unlike ammonia oxidizing bacteria that can produce nitrous oxide under certain conditions, nitrous oxide productions in, um, in Comomox dominated cultures is very, very low. And we've been worried as a field about nitrous oxide emissions from wastewater systems. So we wanted to see why is it so, why so low diversity, right? If it's such a low diversity system, can we rely on it for stable performance, for functional stability? So we went in, in three of these systems, and we started asking questions about maybe Comomox bacteria 
are not diverse at the population level, but maybe we see strain level diversity. This is where they build in the redundancy that is required to maintain in the system. And I'm gonna say this, there is one Comamox bacteria over here, uh, population over here, that's been in that full scale system for over 10 years. Um, uh, and um, you know we had not seen it 10 years ago because we thought it was an NOB, but it's been there for a really long period of time. So we went into three systems. We did full length 16 s ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. Um, and this is a pretty complicated phylogenetic tree, but all I want to show over here is these are nitrospira, these are nitrosomonas, the black are reference sequences, and the colored sequences, pink, bl green, blue, are the full length 16 s sequences of nitrospira and nitrosomonas. And what we can do is we can take these full length sequences and now, because we have not a short fragment, but nearly 1500 base pair fragment, we can start looking at microdiversity, right? Within a species, how many strains are there? And what we see, what's funny is that this is nitrosomonas, this is nitrospira, this is effective diversity. And as you go from zero to 12, increase in microdiversity. What you're fundamentally seeing is nitrosomonas has far lower microdiversity than nitrospira. Nitrospira are highly microdiverse populations and Comamox bacteria are actually part of nitrospira. So we said, okay, from 16S, our hypothesis is turning out right. It's turning out right that nitrospira are so microdiverse, there are lots of strains of nitrospira in there. But when we did genome level analysis, the message was a little bit different. Here you have Comamox bacteria, here you have nitrosomonas, and here you have nitrospira. AI is average amino, amino acid identity. And we start looking at above 90% amino acid identity. It's pretty much the same species. And these are from multiple systems. So you're seeing the same Comamox bacterial species across different wastewater systems. This kind of first like shocked us a little bit. Like why is this literally the same species showing up in multiple systems? Not just us. We've taken genomes published from other research groups in nutrient removal systems, a secondary treatment, and we see the same candidates nitrospira and nitrosa show up. So it's kind of weird that this particular population is so adapted to the wastewater environment at the cost of other. We can then go in and start looking at things like microdiversity. So this is a metric called population ANI. And as you see, and I'm just gonna summarize it. This is Comamox, this is Nitrosomonas, this is Nitrospira. As you see more spread from the one, the more microdiverse. So what you're seeing over here, there are three Comamox bacterial populations that are the dominant ones in these three systems. Not only are they nearly identical to each other at the population level, within each of them, there is very little strain level diversity. So this kind of further complicated that story. Nitrospira, so strain level diversity. So you start seeing stuff below that one line. And this, this means that these genomes are being compared at 99.9% 90, .9 sequence similarity. And so when you start seeing that spread, more diversity. Comamox bacteria, at least the dominant ones, barely anything. So this has led to some like interesting insights for us. Um, is if I take these three nitrifiers that are functional groups that are important from the wastewater side of things, and arrange them on this axis, strain diversity less to more, species diversity less to more, our three sort of main players fall along this spectrum, right? Comamox, single population across different systems, but different strains in different systems. AOB, medium strain level diversity, high species level diversity, and nitrospira, very low species level diversity, high strain level diversity. So this is, you know, it's all sorted with the question and I'm taking a look at time. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, why, why are these, who are these microbes in a drinking water biofilter that don't conform to what we know? Now we are digging further into this, trying to understand what are the factors that underpin microdiversity in nitrifying bacteria, whether it's the affinity, whether it's the growth rate, whether it's substrate concentrations that are driving it. But what we do know is at least from basic uh, ecological theory is that, I'm sorry for that, is that as you start increasing your diversity, 
whether it's at the strain level, whether it's at the species level, you're likely to fall into a zone that's more functionally stable, right? You have different populations and strain level diversity has been shown to, be, to make populations highly adaptable to changing environmental conditions, right? Prochlorococcus -chlor in the ocean, that's the story. It's the strain level diversity that really helps them colonize huge chunks of the ocean. Um, so strain level diversity is important, but you have Comomox over here. They seem to be quite stable, surprisingly, but so, such low diversity, right? So we are actually looking into this quite a bit at the moment. And I have students who are out sampling in systems where we have high level of Comomox bacteria. And we're trying to see whether we can, yeah, understand whether that strain level, one, whether the strain level diversity among nitrospira and OB is simply allelic or is metabolic as well. Like are there, uh, is there something in the metabolism that varies across the strains? And maybe it's the same strain uh, of Comomox bacteria, but what's, why is it so stable? So we don't know yet. Maybe there is metabolic flexibility in there. We actually think right now, based on some preliminary data, that Comomox bacteria might actually use VFAs, volatile fatty acids, in these wastewater systems. Uh, I don't have any proof for that. It's anecdata from looking at different wastewater systems. So this is the first question. Who are these drinking water microbes? And I think it has significant impact uh, on other parts of the water cycle especially nutrient removal. Now, the second question we asked are where are these drinking water microbes, right? We expect to find them, but we haven't found them. So first I'm gonna tell a little bit of story here on the drinking water side of things. You know, we had seen this nice reproducible stuff in, in sense that, you know, filter seeds and maybe the disinfection is selecting for certain groups of microorganisms. So what we really wanted to find is, I wanna see if there is some metabolically uh, signature in terms of who survives disinfection, right? I, I want to go in there and I'll figure out, are there some traits that are in these drinking water microbial populations at the metabolic level that give it like an edge, right? Over others. So our first thought was to try to see what's in the, what's in the public database out there uh, in drinking water systems. And at the metagenome level, the, our drinking water field is terribly, is very, very poor. Out of all the, so this is a paper I was fortunate to be part of. This is the drinking water metagenomes of across all these metagenomes that are very small fraction, less than 1%. So there was no systematics. You know, we couldn't really, like we had done meta-analysis using 16S, we couldn't do that using metagenome data. So our call was to actually go out and collect these data. And the question we wanted to ask was, is there a signature of disinfection that we see in disinfected and non-disinfected systems? And that's the key question, right? So we went and we collected samples in UK, disinfected systems, just like the US and the Netherlands. Netherlands, they haven't disinfected or don't maintain a disinfectant residual in the distribution system and haven't done so since the, sometime in the seventies. And so what we did, we'd pack, pack up a lab, go from Airbnb to Airbnb sampling. And what I want to highlight over here are not only my excellent students who did a lot of hard work over here, Dr. Maria Saviano, Dr. Melina Bautista, Dr. Dai, but also our collaborator, Paul van der Wiel in, in Netherlands, who really made this possible. Now, before I tell the rest of the story, what I want to highlight is that these drinking water systems are very different, different cities, different treatment processes, different source waters, different infrastructure conditions. The only thing that separated them was presence or absence of chlorine as a residual disinfectant. So let's see how the data look. And here we did metagenomics. And what you're seeing over here is clustering of metagenomes based on KMER signals in the reads and the contigs. So this is on the reads, this is on the contigs, gold is disinfected, blue is not disinfected. And as the colors go from light to dark, the systems become more different from each other, metagenomes. What you see is all the disinfected systems look very similar to each other. The non-disinfected look very similar to each other at the read level, at the contig level, suggesting that despite the fact that these metagenomes come from different drinking water systems, disinfection suggests some amount of clustering. We can do some statistics over here and say about 17% of the variability in these metagenomes can be attributed to the presence or absence of disinfectant, right? So in the context of all these other variables that are there, it's quite significant. We can do this at the protein level. We can add, um, predict the proteins or we can use the ones that are annotated for function and we see the same thing. Disinfected, non-disinfected, light to dark, 
this is the functional potential. So disinfected, so disinfection actually selects, or actually, I shouldn't say select, it trims down from all the available metabolism that's in the source water or in the treatment plant to select for a certain group of microorganisms or certain metabolic traits. So this is a pretty long story and I don't have time to go into all of it, but I want to touch on a couple of things, right? These are, these are quite substantial. One thing being that we can take, we went in this data set and we assembled the genomes from disinfected and non-disinfected system. And this is a phylogenetic tree of them. And they are, you know, this is like the heat map or whatever. But what's quite curious is that in disinfected systems, microorganisms have much higher genome sizes than in non-disinfected systems, right? This is a significant difference. So there is a lot of metabolic flexibility, we think, built in in the microbes that survive disinfected systems. If we now go in and take a, a cluster of phylogenetically closely related microorganisms on this phylogenetic tree, and we start doing pathway comparisons, what we find is that in disinfected systems, pathways that are optimized for use of non-traditional carbohydrate sources tend to be far more rich, right? For example, the glyoxylate shunt, the ability to reuse fatty acids, the ability to reuse amino acids are much, much frequently, much more frequently detected in genomes of bacteria from disinfected systems and non-disinfected systems. And our hypothesis is that in disinfected systems, more microbes die per unit time because of the disinfectant stress than in non-disinfected systems. And so if a microbial population is able to reuse decaying biomass without having to build these macromolecules, they're likely able to maintain growth rates that are higher than their inactivation rates. This is a hypothesis from this. And the hypothesis being is that disinfection mediated nutrient cycling is driving microbial populations in drinking, in drinking water disinfected systems. Microbes die, provide readily available nutrients for other microbes that are still alive, right? And so this is the balance potentially. If they, grow, if, they can, if they grow faster than they can die because they're not investing in synthesizing these biomolecules, but rather reusing them, they can persist. So how does it relate to where are these microbes, right? And this has technology implications. I'll be in the interest of time. I'm gonna not talk about that too much right now, but I wanna talk about where are these drinking water microbes. As you can imagine, traveling across the UK, on trains, renting Airbnbs, and then doing the same thing in the Netherlands was actually quite expensive, right? It was very expensive. My students had a wonderful time, uh, you know, um, free vacation, but 20 to 30% of the samples we collected failed DNA extraction, never got enough DNA to do stuff with it. And considering how much we spent on it, that's a lot of money, right? So I was like, you know, I was super proud of what they had accomplished. It was amazing, amazing work. But like, you know, I can calibrate how much DNA I need for one system. I want to be able to go to multiple systems and quickly figure out how much sample I need to process. And so that is one way to do it. And it turns out we just hadn't filtered enough water, right? Sometimes even 10 liters, 15 liters isn't enough. And one way to do it is a flow cytometer. You can quickly count the number of cells, but these are expensive. They're like 50 grand and they can't, they can't put it on a train, right? We, uh, our warranty would be void if we did that. So back in 2015, I started thinking, you know, what we need is something that's really, really dirt cheap and fast. We don't want anything that's accurate. If you can tell me if there are 10 cells or a hundred cells or a thousand cells in a liter, that's going to be enough for me. Cause at least I'll figure out whether to sample or not. <laughs> So we started playing around with a bunch of optics, right? Again, we started dabbling into this because we ran into a problem looking at drinking water microbes. So we adapted this little attachment that PNNL had on their website to image. We moved to something like this, then we moved to a woodcut laser box. And then I had no funding to do any of this. It started getting really, really expensive. So I pitched it to a design team. Uh, capstone design project. And they came up with this particular device. It's called the microbe scope. Um, and they won the design contest actually for that particular thing. So this was in 2018. And what we've done is over the last several years, we've built on this particular design, 2019, 2020, to have a pretty low cost imaging system in place, right? So this system that you're seeing over here 
it's a fairly low cost imaging system, right? Uh, it's very, very small. I can put it in my backpack and I can drive around with it. We assemble, you know, we print uh, the body in, on a 3D printer. We assemble everything in the lab. And we started calling it the autonomous real-time microscope or the RMS. So this is the current prototype. And it image cells really nicely, as you can see over here. And how does it work? It takes a sample, it puts it through uh, aspirates through a microfluidic device, does multimodal imaging, and then object detection and classification. So the device is quite nice in the sense that it's low components. We can build the whole thing for less than $1,000. It's portable, 17 and a half centimeters by 17 centimeters, runs on a battery, and no dyes or stains required, right? No dyes or stains required. You can control it using this very simple graphical user interface. You can specify how often you want to sample, type of microscopy, the resolution you want, and you can move it, toggle it up and down. And we get down to, with this configuration, a resolution of one and a half micron, right? So here you're seeing E. coli cells, and these little spheres are 0.5 micron spheres. No dyes, no stains. The problem is that it actually doesn't really work for drinking water microbes at all, right? It's, it's not, it doesn't work that great. Uh, so, but we didn't hit a dead end because what we learned is that we can do actually really good imaging of algae that are industrially and environmentally relevant. So this is where we've kind of pivoted over the last couple of years. So these, we can monitor community structure in photobioreactors. We can count and image microcystis, ethanozomin in, in, in environment. And also using this image library train sort of uh, convolution neural nets that run on a hundred dollar uh, computer board on that device that can actually do a pretty good job of classifying algal cells with 98%, 96% accuracy in complex samples. So this is where we try to solve a problem of we, why aren't we getting enough DNA? But we've ended up with a spot where we're trying to now fit a need within the photobioreactor systems the only market option they have for monitoring these, these large photobioreactor systems is a flow cam device that costs $75,000. And we can build and deploy these for less than $1,000. That means you can have many of these devices. So this is an example of where Ben is actually running it on this photobioreactor system in Village of Roberts, which is just actually a couple, maybe an hour east of here. And we've also, also discovered that if we take a look at everything that's on the market for harmful algal bloom monitoring, you know, we are actually pretty, doing reasonably well. For a low cost, we are at a TRL of three. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll get to a TRL of seven or eight. So this is where we've attracted some industry partners, uh, industry partners, um, national labs to help us develop this to put it for these harmful algal bloom monitoring. So one example of where we ran into a problem with drinking water monitoring, and it's still helping with drinking water monitoring, but in a very different context. So I'm gonna try to wrap up over here by, you know, I've presented two cases of why looking at the drinking water microbiome is important, purely because it throws up new challenges, you know, a new, a new context. What's also quite important is that when we start studying the drinking water microbiome as a whole, we start thinking about the microbial community differently. Over the same period of time, if I do a Google um, a web of science search and publications, drinking water, disinfection, membrane, UV, biofiltration, the one technology that actually uses microbes for beneficial purposes is vastly understudied compared to all the technologies meant to inactivate or remove microorganisms. So my thesis here is that once we start looking at the drinking water microbiome, once we start understanding its spatial and temporal dynamics, we might start innovating different technologies that leverage microbial communities. And with that, thank you so much for your attention. Yes. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amit. That was a great talk. I, um, so I'm really intrigued by um, this idea that if we understand the microbiome, we may be able to influence other parts of the water cycle. Because I, 
I think about that also with respect to, um, you know, people talk about the one water mm -hmm. paradigm. And um, I think if you think about how do you control salt levels in drinking water, it impacts how you, what happens in the wastewater system, how you can reuse that water. And I wondered um, if you've had any thoughts related to, um, now that you kind of understand which organisms make it through disinfection, could you think about actually seeding the beginning of a drinking water treatment system with organisms that will make it through disinfection that then could protect the mains from corrosion or maybe even um, our probiotics for humans when they come out of the tap? You know, is, are people getting into that kind of stuff? It, it seems really intriguing. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question and a really cool direction of research as well. Right. So, uh, and it comes down to whether we can control the drinking water microbial community. I think to get there, there are like a few, few kind of steps before is one, we need to be able to predict how it behaves in the current system that we have. We need a modeling approach uh, that goes beyond hydraulics because a lot of our drinking water model are hydraulics right now, um, at least in the distribution. We need a modeling approach that takes biology under consideration and can model how species change in distribution system and affected by these. So I think predicting their dynamics is quite important before we start thinking about how we manage them very, very differently. Now on the seeding side of things, you know, I've had that conversation. That is actually, you know, it's, it's um, I, I love the idea, but there are, you know, um, clearly a lot of concerns, right? You know, you don't want to add something to water um, because, you know, the consumer doesn't have a choice on what water they get. So we've, we've taken a slightly different twist on that. So we have a NSF grant, and what we want to do is we want to control the biofilter community in such a way that is easier to disinfect. So you reduce the bacterial concentrations at much lower disinfectant concentrations. So you reduce DBP, all that stuff. So that's one way. Uh, so I can, you know, anybody's interested, happy to talk about that project. What we're trying to do is use genome-informed strategies to manipulate the biofilter community so it's easy to infect. So we're kind of flipping it around a little bit. It's like, okay, you don't want microbes in your drinking water system. Let me manipulate the microbial community. I think maybe there is room for some more growth on you know, manipulating in it in such a way that is a lot more palatable to us. And then when that becomes kind of like more routine, we can start thinking about that. We've, so I think it's, it's an awesome, awesome research direction and question. I think like considering how conservative the water, it's like baby steps towards that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, your, um, your results about the species and strain diversity for wastewater treatment plant was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions related to that topic. Uh, yep. yeah, is there a substrate concentration difference between the between the systems? That is the first question. Second question is, I'm curious, have you seen a similar uh, diversity uh, difference in your um, uh, drinking water okay. yeah, systems? That's cool. Okay. So one, on the wastewater side of things, these are all domestic municipal wastewater systems. The ammonia concentrations are typically like 30 to 50 milligrams per liter. So it's not that different. What we actually think is like, um, so maybe that's one of the reasons why we see such low diversity for Comomox bacteria, such as, you know, it's pretty constrained in terms of that. So not, not a huge amount of variation in these uh, in systems where Comomox bacteria are there. On the drinking water side of things, it's actually quite interesting story, right? So on wastewater in, in these nitrogen removal systems, we see very low diversity of Comomox bacteria. But in the drinking water, what we always find is multiple clades and populations coexisting together. So wastewater is clade A1 and seems like nitrospira nitrosa cluster. Drinking water is clade A1, clade A2, clade B. They all coexist. There is a very interesting study, the only wastewater study that I know of, where they found multiple populations. And this is actually a rotating biological contactor that comes for polishing. And there are eight rotating biological contactors. This is, I think, in Waterloo, Canada right, from Josh Neufeld's group. And what you see is as you go across those eight, you start seeing like the one population that we see in secondary treatment is on the first RBC, but then it goes away and you start seeing lots of other populations. So I think there is a relationship between ammonia availability and Comomox diversity. As you start reducing the amount of ammonia available, concentration or flux through the system, whatever it is, you start seeing sort of diversification at the population level. 
So drinking water systems are quite diverse when it comes to Pneumomox bacteria. Um, even sort of these um, um, rotating biological contactors that are meant for polishing, not necessarily for removing nitrogen, are also quite diverse. Is the secondary systems that are not that diverse? Yeah. Cool. Hi, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed the talk. I've got two wildly different questions. Awesome. So, um, I guess you you talked about the difficulty of getting enough DNA for analysis from drinking water. Yes. Um, and but then you were also comparing non-disinfected and disinfected systems. Disinfected systems usually, and at least in my experience, have far lower biomass. So, how would could you talk about how that would have biased your research? Because you know you're comparing A versus B, but A is often non-detect. Sure, that's that's a great question. So one is disinfected systems tend to have far lower uh, far lower cell counts than non-disinfected system. In fact, we know that the cell counts can be as different as 100 to 1,000 fold uh, between the two. So when we do shotgun metagenomic sequencing, most of the times what we're doing is we never get to the low abundance microorganisms. We, we are kind of getting like the high to medium abundance microorganisms in both situations. So there is going to be, if we, if we incorporate concentrations, biomass concentrations into our insights, it's going to have an effect. It's going to change some of the conclusions. However, if we, if we try to understand who are the dominant microorganisms in this system, dominant to medium microorganisms in this system, and why are they different from the dominant and medium microorganisms in that system, we are looking at the relative abundance level, right? So I think once you bring in the concentration, um, if, you, if you want to relate it to risk assessment and stuff like that, it's going to be very, very different, right? Um, but in terms of ecology, I don't think it's that different. Uh, it does, doesn't matter if it's... Um, um, because it doesn't matter if you have high abundance, low, low, uh, high amount of nucleic acid or low amount of nucleic acid, you're still kind of skimming the top, um, you know, um, medium to high, ab high abundance taxa in each, in each, uh, in each system. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think I'm interpreting, you don't think it's a huge bias. Uh, if, if you were to relate it to risk assessment, I would not take these results comparing disinfected and non-disinfected systems and say, oh, you know. Oh, no, I just mean about your specific conclusions. No, I, I don't think so. I, okay. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my other question is you made an offhand comment about nitrospira having other metabolic abilities. And I think you said volatile fatty acids yeah. in wastewater. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit more and where would the source of the volume? I, I, I have a... I've had that thought in the past. Yeah. So I'm just curious to get your opinion. That's cool. So, so they, what we know is at least some nitrospira can consume formate. Uh, so that's out there. The reason I say VFAs is like, at least the one system where we see really high abundance of nitrospira, uh, especially Comamox bacteria, uh, they receive, um, it's still domestic, but a small fraction of it is from a beverage manufacturer. And it actually, we can measure VFAs acetate in the influent going into the bioreactor and that acetate then goes away. Now, like that's why I said it's anecdata. It's like very, very limited insight. But this is, this is one, one reason why I think we need to look beyond just nitrogen as something that helps that, uh, that feeds Comomox bacteria into potentially other VFAs. There is also a study that came out in mBio. This was last 2021. And it came out from Mengli's research group who's in I believe in Shenzhen or Shenzhen, yeah. And they, they had like an anaerobic zone and they had an aerobic zone, two different wastewater systems. And these are like not highly controlled. They were seeing nitrogen loss entirely in the anaerobic zone, right? And so they, in their, in their thing also, they were kind of speculating the potential for VFAs or something being potential substrate for Comomox bacteria. Like I said, I don't have any firm proof at all. This is just kind of like, what we see in these uh, couple random studies that are out there. Um, and so we've done like the last sampling campaign that we showed, we've done a transect of the whole, whole reactor system across um, an anaerobic three anoxic zones and four aerobic zones and the final polishing zone. We've done a transect. Uh, we've done VFA analysis. Uh, we've also taken samples of transcriptomics throughout. So I'm hopeful that this year we'll have some insight into whether there are certain genes that are differentially expressed for Comomox bacteria in anoxic versus aerobic zones. So uh, I guess we'll see. Yep. 
not the same uh, lines of code. If it's possible to see that, what, what kind of ideas can you, you, you suggest to use to actually look at the activity profiles of these ideas? Yeah. If you, if you say, okay, you see all this strain level diversity or not, and they, they have different uh, genome composition functional genes, which metabolisms are they actually growing in systems as you suggest that one type of system? Yeah. Are they involved in nitrate oxidation and the oxidation? Are they doing both together? Yeah. One of them? Yeah. Or completely something else? Uh, yeah. how, how are you thinking about that? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. So right now, what we're looking at is we're looking at, um, we've, we've gone from uh, structure-based to function-based on the transcriptomic side, right? Just to see what's, what, what's differentially expressed for these Kongmox bacterial population between, between these different zones. Now that still won't get us to the growth uh, situation. We would have to do something like stable isotope probing. We would have to do something like, you know, I don't know, we're not set up for FishMar at all, but we can do a SIP-based analysis. But I think we are not there yet in terms of uh, in terms of both the capacity of our lab at the moment and and just so we we've kind of graduated to okay this is this is worth investing resources in transcriptomics let's see what we see and then if we see something interesting then we can actually do lab based work what we do know is we are hundred percent sure that they oxidize ammonia because there are situations in this particular wastewater treatment plant where there are no other nit ammonia or nitrate oxide I'm sorry no other ammonia oxidizers. Uh, or there's such low abundance that Comamox drives. So we had this, we did this differential kinetic assay test uh, where, um, um, okay, I'm going to have to go back to my notes to figure out, because we tried a range of different nitrification inhibitors. And then we landed on a nitrification inhibitor that selectively shuts off um, AOB, and we can still measure the um, intrinsic kinetics of Comamox bacteria. And in that particular assay, you know, um, the inhibited one was 80 to, percent, 80 to 90 percent of the nitrification rate of the uninhibited one. So we know that Comamox bacteria are actually doing nitrification, but in in situ conditions, we don't know how much they're doing. That's a very, very difficult question because, you know, they when AOB, NOB, and Comamox are present, um, it's it's kind of difficult because the starting and the end point is the same. It's very difficult to kind of tease out. And even if we did SIP, it's going to be very difficult to tease out because how they allocate electrons to go to the electron acceptor versus biomass synthesis can be fundamentally different, uh, different, different in these three of them. So I think that answer is quite challenging to get to. Uh, these different differential inhibitor assays with intrinsic kinetics can actually help us get maximum rates. But in situ, what's happening is, is kind of super challenging. Yeah, yeah. But that's really where, you know, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Oh, with that, I think we should close in the interest of time and just thank our speaker again. Thanks, Amit.